Astro is an all-in-one web framework for building fast, content-focused websites like landing pages, blogs, technical documentation, and more. In this course, James Q. Quick will teach you about this increasingly popular framework. James is a popular instructor and keynote conference speaker. He's the perfect person to teach you about Astro. Let's learn all about Astro, one of the most exciting and up-and-coming JavaScript frameworks. My name is James Hugh Quick, and I absolutely love Astro. So in this crash course, we're gonna cover some of the core concepts of Astro along the way. We'll talk about file-based routing, creating and managing Markdown and MDX content with content collections and TypeScript. We'll talk about dynamic routes, and we'll even at the end of this video get into deploying this to Netlify and Vercel. We'll also talk about the server-side capabilities of Astro going from a statically generated site to a server-side rendered site, and show you how you can add server endpoints to your Astro applications as well. Lastly, we'll talk about a few neat features of Astro along the way, like view transitions, which allows you to add beautiful transitions between your pages in your Astro application with just one line of code. Now, if you enjoy what we cover in this crash course and you want to learn more, you can check out my full course at astrocourse.dev to learn all the ins and outs of Astro 3.0. That said, let's go ahead and get started. Let's start on the Astro documentation page where we can see the getting started instructions for creating a brand new project with Astro version three, which is the most recent version of Astro. Now on this documentation page, they kind of give you an overview, some of the things that we've talked about, some key features, et cetera. And then if you scroll down, they'll give you a couple of ways to get started with Astro. One cool way to do that is with the astro.new website. And what this is, is a collection of different Astro projects that you can open up that have already been created and kind of get started working with them right inside of StackBlitz. Now, in this case, we're gonna create our own project from scratch. So we're gonna do this inside of our own VS Code window and terminal to be able to create the project and then go and work and build out the tutorial or the blog that we're going to build. Now, one thing I do wanna show and we'll kind of reference this throughout this crash course is the ability to search for anything that we might want in this course on the Astro documentation page. So once you get to the Astro docs, you can come up to the top left and you can click to open the search window and you can search for uh, server, anything server side rendering, for example, and then click on one of these and go straight to those pages. The other thing I wanna show you that's pretty neat is on this page, you can hold Command K on Mac or Control K on Windows to be able to pull that up as well. So you don't have to go and click that yourself. You can just open that with the shortcut window. That said, what we're gonna do is copy this command to be able to create a brand new Astro project and then run this in our terminal so that we can get started. So I'm gonna scroll over to my VS Code window and this is an open empty VS Code window and I'm going to first switch over to the directory that I want to create the project. So I'm gonna switch into code and then my demos directory. And then from here, I'm gonna paste in that command from the Astro docs to create the new project. So once I press enter, this will ask me a few different things. First of all, are we okay installing the package that's needed to generate our project? And this is actually a good error to have here. So with the latest version of Astro, you're required to have a version 18 or higher of Node.js to be able to run the installer. So I wanted to leave this in as a reminder that you'll need to be working with a version 18 or higher. Now for me personally, I use NVM to manage my different versions of Node to handle this. This is the easiest way that I found to handle working with different versions of Node. So I can use my NVM command and then NVM use and then type 18. And this will let me use a version of Node that is 18. Now I can also use NVM to install a version of Node like 20, for example, and that will go and install a different version of Node that I could use at any time. But in this case, since I'm now using version 18, I can scroll back through my commands and run that same create command inside of my terminal. Now you see we get the really awesome animated experience where Astro is gonna walk us through creating this new project. So in this case, we need to give it a folder that we're gonna create the project in. I'm gonna call this FCC Astro Crash Course. So you'll just do dot slash and then whatever the folder is of whatever the name is of the folder that you want it to create in. In this case, we're gonna start with sample files. You could also choose a blog template where they'll have a lot of the stuff done that we will be building from scratch. You could also additionally choose an empty project to just start completely from scratch. In this case, we'll accept the sample files. And what it's doing now is it's gonna to start to copy over the sample files, which is done. And then it's gonna ask whether or not we want it to install the dependencies and we can press enter on yes and let it go and run and install all of these dependencies. 
So we'll let that run for a second and come back when it's finished. All right, so those dependencies have been installed. And the next question is, do we plan to write TypeScript, which in this case we do, so we'll click yes. And then we'll choose the strict or recommended version of how strict with TypeScript we should be. Lastly, the question is, do we want this to initialize a new Git repository? In this case, we'll say yes, because we're gonna use this repository to deploy this later on to Netlify and Vercel. So we'll click yes here. And then we get our out animation from Houston, which is the Astro mascot. We'll come back to Houston in a little bit. And the next thing I wanna do is open this project inside of VS Code. So I can use the command code-r, which means to reuse the window that I'm currently in. And then I'm gonna choose my SCC Astro Crash Course window. Notice it pops up here with this IntelliSense. If you're curious where this little window is coming from, this is coming from an extension called fig.io which is really great to kind of supercharge your powers inside of your terminal. So I'm gonna press enter, and then we'll open this up inside of that same window in VS Code. And now I'm gonna to go to the bottom and open my terminal again. And inside of here, I'm gonna run npm run dev, and this should now start our Astro project, and it will run it at port 4321. They chose this port because it is kind of like 4321 blast off, which is kind of neat. So I'm gonna open a new tab in my browser and open up my browser to localhost 4321. And you see, this is the starter application that we get with Astro, where we have a welcome to Astro. We have a little code challenge of how to make an update to this, which is right here. Then we have links to documentation, integration, themes, community, et cetera. So we have our beginner Astro application created. Let's go and walk through the code and talk a little bit about what all is there. So first off, we have our public directory. This is where we would store any public assets like images or other things that we want to be publicly available from our site. Now these are gonna be directly available after the end of the URL. So what this means is since we have favicon.svg, we could come to the end of our URL and type in favicon.svg. And now that'll take us to that file, which is not gonna show a whole lot because it's an SVG and we're not gonna have good visibility here, but we do have the access to be able to access that directly. So anything that you put inside of the public directory will just be shipped with your built version of your site and included and would be available after the slash in your URL. After that, we have our source directory. This is where all of our code is really going to live. And what Astro really depends on is this page-based routing where we have different files under the pages directory are gonna represent, as you might have guessed it, different pages in your application. So let's just open the index.astro file and take a look. The first thing we'll notice is that it is a .astro file. It's not a .js, it's not a .ts, this is .astro. And this obviously is going to signify to the developer, to yourself, and to your editor, we'll talk about this in a minute, that this is an Astro component. Now, Astro components are made up of two different sections. There is the kind of JavaScript section, which goes in these three dash blocks and we could call these front matter. We'll talk more about front matter inside of markdown files, but inside of these three dash blocks, we can add any sort of JavaScript that we want, including importing other components. So you can see we import our layout and our card, and in this case, we can find both of these in their appropriate directories. Under layout is the first one. If we scroll down, we see a reference to slot. Now slot is where we're going to take whatever information is in between this component when we use it, the layout component, and then inject that right inside of the component that we have defined here. So what this looks like, if we come down to our index.astro, since we wrap this entire page, which has a lot of code in it, since we wrap this entire page with this layout component, all of the stuff in between the layout tags, which is here, all of that is considered the slot and that will be rendered inside of this layout component right here. So inside of the body. Now inside of the layout, you'll also see a few other things. You'll see that we can define uh, TypeScript interfaces for our props. After we define those, we can then destructure those properties and then use them inside of our application, just like we're using the title inside of the title tag inside of the head for our application. Now notice we can use these JavaScript variables by putting them in between the two brackets. So inside of these two brackets, we're able to basically kind of write JavaScript here, which enables us to use variables that we've defined up above. So in this layout file, you'll also see the other components that make up a basic HTML file. You'll see the doc type defined at the top. You'll see the HTML tag. 
you'll see head and we'll we'll see a few different of our meta tags here like description viewport etc we'll also see a reference to our title and then if we scroll down we'll see a lot of css in here now astro has a few different ways that you can write css one of the ways that you can do that is just by adding a style tag right inside of your astro components now this may or may not make you excited this is something that gets debated about whether or not your style should be co-located with your actual markdown and with your javascript but in astro you have the ability to write all three together so your javascript your markup or your html and then your styles in here as well now styles typically in here are scoped to a given component so you can see here that we have an is global tag that's associated with this style which means all of these styles are going to be applied to every single page on our application versus if we go to our index.astro component and scroll down there's going to be styles here and these styles are not global. They're only referencing material that's inside of the component that it's in, which in this case is a page component, which is the index.astro. Now we can see another good example of this with the actual card component. You can see we define our props here. We destructure those props. We have markup. We reference those properties inside of our markup. And then we also have style tags down here as well. Now, again, these styles are only applying to things that are inside of this card component and won't be applied anywhere else. So an example of this is if I were to select the main tag and did a background color of red, this actually won't appear to have any difference or make any difference on our application. And that's because there's no main tag inside of this card component and these styles are only applied to that. However, if I went to the layout and I now chose to select the main tag and did a background of red, now we'll see that this red color is going to come into play because these styles are global and are going to be applied anywhere there is a main tag. So really important to remember that the styles inside of Astro by default are scoped to that component and won't be interfering with other styles that you have in other components. Now, in this case, in this crash course, we're going to use Tailwind CSS to style our application. So we're actually not going to worry about all of these styles that are defined inside of here. We'll come back and clean these out in a minute and kind of reset this with some beginner styles for us to work with. But if you were building an Astro project yourself, you do have a few different ways that you could choose to do CSS. In this case, we are just going to use Tailwind CSS, which has become incredibly popular. So that's the majority of the basics of the layout for your code inside of the source directory. There's a few other files, a gitignore file, which is pretty standard. There's also the astro.config file. And this is really important because this is where we can add integrations in Astro. We can also define different things about our project, like how this project is going to be built and where it's going to be hosted. So by default, Astro is a statically generated site. We'll talk more and more about this. We don't have to configure anything for that to be supported, but if we wanted to convert this to be a server-side rendered site, we could configure this in here and then configure where and how we want to deploy this. At the end of this video, we'll talk about deploying this to both Netlify and Vercel, but in this case, we don't have anything to change yet in the Astro config, although we will come back to this shortly. Next up, we have our package.json with a few commands on how to run the project. We have the readme, and then we have a TS config, which just extends the TypeScript config that comes from Astro. So this is going to give us all the basic rules for working with TypeScript inside of our Astro project. You could go and customize that in any way that you want to, but in this case, we don't need to. Now, I want to take a few minutes to talk about setting up your VS Code instance to work with Astro in the best way. Now, the most important thing you'll need to install is the actual Astro extension, which comes from Astro themselves. Now, what this does is it allows these Astro components, these Astro files to be recognized as Astro files so that we get appropriate IntelliSense, coloring, et cetera. So notice down at the bottom here that VS Code is recognizing this as an Astro file. And then based on that and based on this extension knows what to do and how to color this. Now, if we were to disable this just to show you what this looks like, and we restart this, all of our code highlighting, our syntax, our IntelliSense, et cetera, goes away inside of these Astro components. And VS Code considers this to be a plain text file, which is obviously not what we want. So you'll wanna make sure to install the Astro extension to get all of the benefits that come along with it. It's by far the best way to work with Astro. 
So I'm going to enable that and notice all of that comes back. Now, another one that I have installed is an Astro snippets extension. There's lots that you can do with Astro in terms of different types of file, different things you might want to do. This is a great set of snippets that you could start with to kind of help generate components quicker and easier for you as you're going along. Now, there's one more extension from the Astro team, which is the Houston extension. Now, Houston is the actual mascot for Astro, and they've built a lot of fun things around this. So with the Houston extension, you get the Astro VS Code theme mimicking the colors from Houston, which is pretty neat. I, I like this a lot. In addition to that, inside of the file explorer, you get a little Houston tab and you get kind of an animated Houston icon that shows you whether or not your application is running well or not based on it being happy or sad. So it's a nice little touch to kind of feel like you're inside of the Astro community. So you can install this and kind of have some fun with that if you're interested. Now, me personally, I'm using my personal James Q Quick theme. So if you're interested in having your colors look exactly like mine, you can search James Q Quick to get set up there. The last thing I want to show you is the Tailwind CSS IntelliSense extension. This is one that I use all the time when working with Tailwind so that it helps me kind of autocomplete or remember what all the different styles are that, that I'm trying to work with. So you'll see this more as we work, work through this and start writing some code. Now with all of that set up, let's go back to the Astro documentation and see how to install Tailwind. So let's just search in the documentation for Tailwind and we'll be taken to the Astro JS Tailwind extension or integration that we can add, which is one of the really cool things about Astro is that it comes with integrations, which makes it really easy to add support for other UI frameworks, for example, to be able to deploy SSR to different places and a bunch of other really neat things. So let's scroll down. We can kind of skip the Y tailwind and let's come down to the NPX Astro add tailwind command, which allows us to add tailwind in one command and be able to work with it right after that. So let's stop our running application. Let's paste in our NPX Astro add tailwind command. And this will kind of walk us through what it's going to do to make sure we're okay with it doing all of these things. So do we want to allow it to install the tailwind CSS extension and the Astro JS tailwind package? Yes, absolutely. In this case, it says it's going to generate a Tailwind config file, which we absolutely want. So we'll say yes. And then lastly, it says it's going to update the Astro config file to be able to support Tailwind. So we'll say yes to that as well. Now, just to confirm what this did, let's search for the Astro config file. Let's open this up. And what it did is it added an integration section here. And then inside of that array, it added a call to the Tailwind function that gets imported from the Astro JS Tailwind package. So this in theory is how we would manually install integrations into our applications. But in this case, Astro gives us this command, the Astro add command to be able to do all this stuff for us, which is really, really nice. So let's go into our layout file and let's get rid of all of the styles that are defined in here because we're going to use Tailwind for our styles and not use the built-in styles that come with the application. Now, just to make sure, let's go ahead and run this to have this running. We can make a few changes inside of this layout file to start to get the base of our application going. Now, the first thing to notice is that we're only defining one property that could be passed in as props, which is the title. Now, we could additionally add extra ones like the description. We can have this be optional. So we'll have that be defined as a string. So the optional question mark or the question mark denotes this as optional. And we can also define an image in here as well. So now that we get all three of those, we can destructure them so that we can be able to use these as well. All right, so we have these three properties, but we're not using all of them just yet. We're only referencing the title and not the description or the image yet. So inside of the content for the description, we could reset this to be description. And we could also reference our image by using it for the OG image type. Now we're not going to get all the way into all of the different OG tags that we could use. Let's start with a meta tag with a property of OG image. And then we'll say the content is going to be that image property that we pass in. So we'll put this in here as image. Now, one thing you might be wondering is what if the description and the image are not passed in here? we should probably have a default property that we can use. So in this case for the description, we can set the default right in line in here by doing equals and then assigning this to a string. Now what we're building is a, an application called Rhythm Nation, and this is a community of music producers and enthusiasts. 
And then we want to give a default value to the image as well. Now we'll come back to this in the images section, but I'm going to set this to a default of slash images slash band dot JPEG. Now, remember we talked about the public directory. What this is referring to would be a file band.jpg inside of an images directory inside of public, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. For now, we're just kind of setting these by default. Now, just to show that these are coming up, we can come back to our running application, which now looks a little bit different because we got rid of those styles. And if we look inside of the head, we should see that we now see our description here. We also see our OG image, which if we try to access will not be available yet. And then we still have our same title, which is great. So all those things are working well. There's a lot more that you could dive into with OG tags for helping your website show up on social media posts, for example, or embeds in Slack or Discord. But that's a conversation for another day. Just know that you have complete control to add all of those inside of here. Now, inside of the layout, what I want to do is add some Tailwind classes in here. And what we can start with is a min height of screen. So before we save that, let's go and look at the body tag in here. And if we see this body tag is not taking up the entire height. So we can start to style that a little bit with min h of screen. And now we should see that this body is now taking up the entire height, which also is confirming that our Tailwind classes are working. Now from here, I wanna add a header component that can show the basics of our application. So in this case, I'm going to copy a little bit of code, but inside of components, I'm going to create the header.astro component, and I'm going to paste in some starter code for us to work with. Now we'll walk through the code that's here. So we define our header. We give some Tailwind CSS classes. Again, this is not a crash course on Tailwind specifically, but we have some classes for our header. We then have an image icon that we can have to show in the top left. We'll come back to that in a second. Then we have a few links to the different pages on this application, like the homepage, the about, and the blog. So from here, what I wanna do is import this into our body or into the body of the layout component. So I can actually open bracket and start to type our header. And then oftentimes I'll get IntelliSense for this, but it looks like it's not opening for me. So I can go and do a manual import up here instead. So at the top of this, we can import header from, and then we'll go back a directory into the components directory and then grab the header.astro. So we could save this and we should now see the basics of our application starting to come together. We have our header up here. We have a missing icon up here and we'll need to add that inside of our source code so that we can actually have this show up. So one of the things that we can do is go ahead and go to the Astro course demo final source code and then inside of the public directory, we have an images directory and we have a heartbeat.png, both of which we're going to need. So we can click on the heartbeat.png and we can download this. So we can download that file. And then additionally, we're gonna need the images directory as well. So from the images directory, we can download this directory as well. All right, so that should download all of those files. And so what you'll need to do is go and find the heartbeat image, and then that directory that we just downloaded, and we'll add that into our source code. So in this case, I'm gonna take the heartbeat.png and I'm gonna add this into the public directory. So there that is there. And if we look inside of our header, it's referencing slash heartbeat.png, which should reference a heartbeat image right inside of that public directory. So now if we come back and go to our application and refresh, we should see that heartbeat icon is starting to show up, which is great. Now, the other thing we wanted to do is take those images that we downloaded in the zip folder and add those to the public directory as well. So inside of the public directory, I'm gonna create an images folder and I'm gonna drag all those images that we just downloaded into that folder. So into the images directory here. Now, one additional benefit of that, if we remember, is back in the layout component, we defined a default image for our OG image to be inside of the images directory, just like we did, and then the band.jpg. So this now should be the default image that shows up for our OG image tags. And actually we can test this by going directly to this inside of the URL. So we go to slash images and then slash band dot, uh, not jog, but JPEG. And we should now see this entire image showing up. So we know that that is working as well. So we have our images copied over, which is exactly what we want. We have our header showing up up here above. 
We have links to our different pages, which we haven't created yet. And now we can go into our index component, that root page, and we can get rid of all of the styles. So we can delete all of these styles and we can delete all of the main content that's in here as well. So let's just scroll all the way through and get rid of everything inside of main. And in this case, we're gonna update this title to be relevant to the blog post, the blog site that we're working on, which is the Rhythm Nation blog. So it's just the demo idea here, but let's go ahead and type that in, Rhythm Nation blog. And now we can add a title to this as well. So I'm gonna actually create a new component for an H1 that we can reuse. So we'll create an H1 component dot Astro. I'm gonna copy over the tiny bit of code that we have for this, where we define our props. We take a text property as our prop, we destructure that, and then we put it inside of an H1 that already has the Tailwind styles created. So I'm gonna save this, and then back inside of the index, we can now reference our H1 component, and we'll pass in a property of rhythm nation, and then we'll need to import this component so that we can reference it. So we'll import H1 from, and then we'll go into that components directory, and then we'll grab the h1.astro. And now we should see a basic title showing up. Now, one thing you might notice is that we need some spacing on the outside of this. So one more component that we're going to create is the main.astro component. And what we're gonna do is use this component to wrap all of the other things that we do. So in this case, I'm gonna open up a main tag, and then we'll pass in everything in between as the slot. And then we'll just add some Tailwind classes in here. So we'll have a PX of 24, which is padding X. We'll set a max width of seven XL. We'll set MX to be auto, which is gonna automatically center everything horizontally. And then we'll set the width to be full. And then lastly, we can set the padding to be five on screens that are at max small, size. So this is saying that we'll have a padding X of five on screens, extra small and small. And then above that, anything bigger will have a padding X of 24. Now, the last thing we'll need to do, we can actually duplicate this import. We can import the main component from that components directory, and we can now use our main component instead of just the main tag. And that should wrap everything and give some spacing on the outside. So now we have a clean, section here for our main content that has that padding on the outside. We have our header, we have our images loaded, and we can start to do more with this application by building out blog functionality and leveraging the content collection feature in Astro, which is one of my favorite features of Astro. Now, if we look at the final demo from the full Astro course, we can see we have a homepage where we show a bunch of blog posts, we have tags, etc. But what I wanna show you is that if we go to the slash blog page, we can see a list of all of these blog posts, which is what we're gonna to start to work on now. So we can see a list of all the blog posts in addition to all the images that are associated with them. So if we scroll through, we can see these blog posts. And then if we click on one, we'll actually be taken to the specific route for that individual page. So notice inside of the URL, we have our root URL slash blog and then slash the title of that blog post in a slugified version, which means having dashes in between all of the words. So let's start to work on setting up our application in this crash course to be able to work with Markdown using content collections in Astro. So let's go over to the Astro documentation and let's search for content collections. So what content collections are, are a way to organize and manage and author content in any Astro project. And in my personal opinion, this is the best experience for working with content, specifically Markdown and or MDX content that I've ever seen across any platform, which gets me really, really excited. So our content collections, again, give us a way to organize all these inside of a special directory in Astro called content directory. So under source slash content, we can then create a directory for each different type of content that we want to create. In this case, their demo, they have newsletter. In our case, we will have blog, and that's where all of our blog posts will live as markdown files inside of there. Now you can scroll down and find a lot more about this with multiple collections, etc. But the one thing I do want to show you is how to define collections inside of the content config file which is a TypeScript file and allows you to define types for your individual collections like the blog collection using Zod to have TypeScript type associated with each of your collections. 
So you define a collection, you define a schema, and you can define all of the different properties that are gonna be associated with each piece of content. Now, before we actually get into the code, the one thing we will need to do is go back to the Astro course demo and we'll need to download some sample markdown files that we have in here to reference inside of our application. So inside of the Astro course demo, there is the source directory and then inside of there, just like we talked about is a content directory and then inside of there is the post directory. So what you'll wanna do is go and download this entire directory of all of these posts. Now, after you do that, you'll wanna make sure to extract all of those and then we'll go inside of our source directory. We'll now create our content directory and then inside of there, we'll create another new folder called posts and then we'll take all of that that we just copied and drag it into the post directory. Now, one thing I did skip from copying over is the images directory that you can see here, but that's something we'll come back to when we get into image optimizations. So let's just take a, a real quick look at what we have inside of this content. So inside of here, we have our front matter at the top of each one of these markdown files. And we have an author, we have categories, we have a date, we have whether or not this blog post is featured, we have an, a cover image to be referenced, and then we have a title. Now this is all the front matter and what we're gonna do with content collections is define a data type that represents this and stores or, or gives us IntelliSense inside of our editor to know which of these properties to associate with our given blog post, specifically with a given collection, which in this case is our blog post. Now at the bottom of this, you can see all of the sample markdown that's included here. So this is just some getting started markdown so that we have something to render. You could obviously go and create your own markdown with your own content if you wanted to. Now, one thing I do wanna change is the reference to where these images are stored. So actually I'm going to select this whole thing and I'm gonna do Command Shift F on Mac or Control Shift F on Windows. And I'm gonna change this slightly and I'm gonna get rid of this leading dot in each one of these blog posts or each one of these markdown files. And we'll come back to that again when we talk about updating our images to work with the image component that comes with Astro to optimize our images. But right now I want this to point to the public images directory where those different images are. Again, we'll come back to this in a minute. So we have our sample markdown. Now we need to go into the content directory and we need to create our config.ts file. So let's start to work on defining a content collection inside of this config file. Now to start, we're gonna import the define collection function and then the Z for Zod from the Astro content import. So this is giving a little bit of an issue saying it cannot be found. This should be okay. So as we go through this, we'll make sure to run it just to make sure. And then from here, I want to define my post collection and this is going to call the define collection function. We'll call this and we'll pass it a config object. Now this config object will then have a schema and we'll say that the schema is going to be a Z dot object, which is a function and we'll pass that a configuration object as well. So we're using Z dot object to say that this schema is going to be an object and then now we can define the different properties that it's going to have. So we can define it to have a property of author and then using Z, which is Zod, we can say we're, this is going to be a string then we'll have a date, which in this case is also a string. We'll have an image, which is a string. We'll come back to this in a minute. And then we'll have a title, which is a string as well. Now, the cool thing about Zod is that it has other data types that you can work with, where you can add a lot of customization on what exactly these types should look like. And then lastly, what we wanna do is export a variable called collections. And this is going to be an object and we'll say a key is going to be post and then it's going to have a value of post collection. And it's really important that this word here match up with the name of the directory that that content is in. So those two things should match, which means our post collection should be inside of this post directory inside of content. So now that we have our definitions for our content, we want to start to query this content so that we can start to display this inside of our slash blog page. So to do this, we'll need to create another component inside of our pages directory, and we're gonna create the blog.astro component. Now in here, we can start to query our content by referencing the get collection function that comes from that astro content namespace. 
So this is going to be a function that we can call to get the content associated with a specific collection. So in this case, we're going to assign this to a variable called posts. We're going to await a call to get collection. And then inside of a string, we're going to pass it the name of the content that we're looking for. Now notice it gives me IntelliSense in here because it knows what the different content collections are that I've defined. So I can now query these posts inside of here. And now we can be able, we should be able to log the post to the console. So important to note with Astro is all of this code is going to be run statically at build time. So it won't quite look this way when we run this now, but when this is deployed, all of this content is going to be queried and generated at build time and then deployed statically. We'll talk more about this as we convert to SSR later in this video. But in this case, we should be able to go back to our site. We should be able to click on the blog page. Nothing will show up, but if we go back to our logs, we should see that this is actually querying all of this content, which is pretty nice. So what I want to do is start to be able to display the basics here. So one thing I'm going to do is copy over the structure of a page from that root page. And now we'll say this title is going to be a blog and then rhythm nation, maybe not rhythm nation blog, cause that's repetitive. We also have missing imports. So I can do command and period and go to add all missing imports. This would be control period. If you're on a windows machine, now we have all of our imports and then we can also update this to be blog. So now we should at least have the basics of a page kind of showing here. So Rhythm Nation blog, so that's great. But now we wanna actually be able to display that content. So one of, the, one of the things that we could do is we could iterate through our post. So we could say post dot and then map and then get a reference to each post. And then for each post, what do we want to return? So inside, inside of here, we could start with an H2 and then reference the post dot data that's going to be all of our front matter and then inside of here when we press enter we now get intellisense for all those properties which in this case i'm going to choose the title so this is not going to look great but at least we have the ability to show that all these post titles are being queried here now the other thing we might want to do is wrap this all in an anchor tag so if we kind of stub out an anchor tag here and wrap our h2 what we want to do is we want to set the href to a particular URL that will take the user to that blog post. So in this case, we can define this ourselves by using an ES6 template literal string. And we could say this is going to take the user to slash blog slash, and then inside of our template literal string, we can reference the post dot slug. So this is going to be the slugified version of that based on the name of that actual file. So now each one of these should be a link to that blog post, even though that page doesn't exist yet. So if we hover on this on the bottom left, you can see it links to slash blog slash blah, blah, blah. If we click on this, it doesn't exist. And that's our responsibility to go and create that. So we want to do a couple of things in here to make this look a little bit better. We'll cheat a little bit and copy in some components to help us. We'll start with the post list dot astro component. And now in this case, what we're going to do is define our props to take in a prop of post, which is an array of a collection entry of the type of posts. Now, again, post is going back to that collection that we define, and we're just saying we have a, an array of those posts that we're passing inside of here. Now, then we have our Tailwind CSS to be able to display a CSS grid here with two columns on bigger screens and then go down to one column on smaller screens. And then we display each individual post with a post component that we haven't created yet. So inside of our posts or inside of components, we'll create one more component. And this is going to be the post component that we can paste in. All right, so very similar. We define a prop in here where we're gonna take one property, which is a collection entry of posts. So it's one post. We then destructure that and now we can reference each piece of that data. So notice we also have the same kind of link in here with an H2 where we have the post.data.title and then we have the link that's linking to slash blog and then the slug. We also are referencing the body of our blog post, but we're using a few CSS or Tailwind CSS classes or one in here to, to say line clamp of two. This will give it a maximum line, uh, maximum display of two lines and then use ellipses to finish it out. 
And then at the top of this, we're also referencing our image, which we'll come back to in a minute as we go and optimize these in a second. So we can save this, we can save the post list component. Now let's go back to our blog page and let's get rid of this log and just make sure all this stuff looks good. So let's scroll to the bottom of these logs in the terminal. There we go. And then now if we refresh our page here, nothing looks different because we actually need to use that post list component. So we'll replace the anchor tag that we wrote. We'll reference the post list component and then we'll pass into that our post property that we queried above. And then we'll need to also import this. So I'm gonna copy the layout import, paste in post list, and then paste in or type in post list here as well. And this is from the components, not the layouts directory. So now we should see that we're actually loading each of these posts and it's linking to the individual page for that post. So notice this doesn't display yet because we haven't generated those pages, but we do have the ability to link to each individual blog post, which is pretty neat. Now let's go ahead and generate the pages for each one of these. Now to do this, let's go to the Astro documentation really quick to kind of show you how we're going to. So we can search for dynamic routes. And in this case, what we do is define a file that basically is going to have a placeholder in the file name that tells us some property that we can use to then query and display the appropriate information for that post. Now, in our case, what we're going to reference is the slug of the blog post. So inside of our pages directory, we can create a new folder slash uh, our blog. And then inside of here, we're going to create a new file that says inside of brackets slug and then dot astro. Now, what this means again is that we're going to be able to get the slug for each one of these posts by defining each one of the different routes that we have. Now, the way we define each one of these routes is we open up our JavaScript snippet here, and then we're going to export a function called get static paths. This is going to be an async function. And then inside of here, we want to query all of our posts. So just like we did before, we'll call get collection and we'll pass in the post name and we'll need to import that get collection function. So we'll import this get collection and we'll also import collection entry from Astro content. And once we have each one of our posts, what we want to use, what we want to do is use those posts to be able to generate the paths that should be created by Astro for each one of these different individual blog posts. So we're going to create a paths property. We'll take our post variable, we'll map through it. We'll get a reference to each post. And then inside of here, we want to return an object. And this is going to have a couple of different properties. The first one is params. So now inside of our params, these are params that we can pass directly to this component. So we want to pass in that slug property and it's going to come from post.slug. And then we want to pass in our props. So our props is going to be the post itself. So by, def by exporting this get static paths function, we're basically defining a path and a property for each one of these blog posts that will generate statically for our application. Now from here, we can kind of define how this component is going to work. So we'll define the props type. This is going to have one property of posts that's going to be a collection entry. It's also going to be referencing that post collection. So we'll have one post is being passed in. We can then destructure this so we can get the post from astro.props. And then from that post, we can grab the content. So we can destructure the content itself from the post.render function, which is an async function. Now from here, we want to uh, kind of lay out a blog post uh, page, just like we've done a few times before. So let's copy over a few of these different components and let's just paste this in. So I'll have our layout, we'll have our main and we'll have our H1 and we can import all of these at the top. So we can import layout and we can import the H1 and lastly, our main. And so we've imported all three of the components that we're going to use in here. And just to start, we can now start to update a bit of information based on this individual blog post. So in this title, we want this to actually be the title of the blog post that we're on. So we can take post dot data dot title. And then inside of our H1 on the page, we can do the same thing. So we want to reference our post dot data 
dot title. So what we should have done now is we should have generated a page for each one of our blog posts that will, in this case, just display the title of that blog post. So if we click on one of these blog posts from the slash blog page, it should take us to this page, but it looks like we have some sort of error in how we defined our get static pass function. So it is expecting an array, but got undefined. So let's go back up and double check that. So it looks like we defined our paths, but we didn't return this in the end. So the most important part about the get static paths function is it has to return those paths so that Astro knows what to do with them to generate the individual pages. So hopefully that will handle this. Now, if we refresh, we see the title now coming up at the top and we have our individual blog post pages for each of these individual blog posts. So that's great. We have each of those defined. We can now kind of copy a little bit of code from the post component. So if we go back to the post component and look at uh, the image, we can now copy this in just so we're starting to display some more things on here. So if we paste this in under the H1, we should now see our images popping up. So it looks like it's not quite the size that we want because we're now shrinking this to be a width of 600. So we can update this to be 1024. And I think that should give us now kind of the full screen or almost full screen page that we're looking for. And then lastly, we can render this content component that we got from the render function of our post. So up here we called post.render, we got the content uh, component, we can render this, but it's not gonna look great. So you can see we have all of our content here, but this doesn't quite look great. And that's because we don't have any styles defined for this. Now in our case, what we're gonna use is the Tailwind CSS typography package to handle this for us. So Tailwind CSS typography, you can search this. Basically what we're gonna do is install this plugin and then we'll be able to use this inside of our page to be able to display this stuff appropriately. So I'm gonna copy this install command. Let's go back, let's uh, paste this in. And this is going to install the Tailwind CSS typography package. Then inside of our Tailwind config, we need to make sure to reference this. So we're going to, inside of this array, require, and then we're going to require the Tailwind CSS typography package. And then lastly, for this to work inside of where we render our content, we're going to need to wrap this in a class or a div that has a few classes, primarily the pros and pros 2XL class. So those are the classes that kind of activate this extension or to be able to use that plugin to be able to render all of our content. So let's go ahead and run this with our run dev command. We can now come back to our application. We can refresh this and we should see that this now is looking a lot better and this is starting to feel like a real blog. So we have, if we go back, we have a list of all of our blog posts. And then we can click on the individual pages, see the image and see all the content, which is pretty neat. Now, one thing that's interesting that's not very optimized on here is the way we're referencing our images. So if we go into our network tab and just look at our images as they load in, we'll notice a couple of things couple of things. We're loading all of these images even before we scroll down to see them. So that's a little bit unnecessary. It would be more optimal if we were only loading images as we're getting close to scrolling down to them. And then we'll also see that these are being loaded as JPEG files, which are not the most optimal format. WebP would be a better format. And see that these are really big images. So six megabytes, four megabytes, etc. So we can use the Astro image component to make this a lot better and much more optimal. So let's go back to the Astro documentation and let's just search for image. And let's just go to the top level images here. And let's go down to the actual image component, which is what we're going to use to be able to do a lot of optimizations with our images. So we can import the image component from the image assets namespace and basically just replace the regular IMG tag that we were already using. We'll have to do a few more things in here, but let's start with that. So inside of our post component, we can copy in the import for this image component, and we can now replace that IMG with our image component. Now, if we come back to our application, we can see that this is going to work, but nothing has really changed. So we're still loading all of these files, and they're still JPEGs, and they're still pretty big. So one of the things we want to do is actually move this images directory into our content directory. And actually specifically, we're gonna move this into our slash post directory. 
because these are going to be all the images that are associated with these posts. Now then inside of our markdown, we're going to update. If you remember, we changed this at the beginning. We're going to select this little bit and we'll do command shift F or control shift F to select all of that. And what we want to do is we want to update this to go from slash to dot slash. So slash implies that it should look at the root of the application, which is at the end of the URL. Dot slash now means we should look relative to where the actual file is. So in this case, it's going to be relative to where this markdown file is. And that's going to be inside of that post directory. So I'm going to update each one of these posts to reference dot slash image. And we would think that would work, but we actually have an error in here of something isn't working. And that's because we need to go back to our config for content collections, and we need to update our image property to actually use an image object that Astro gives to us. So what we're gonna do is turn, uh, instead of returning this object directly, we're gonna turn this schema value into a function. And so this is going to then return that Z dot object. But by defining this as an, a function, we can now destructure a property called image. And now we can reference our image type to be of type image or call that image function. So this is going to more explicitly reference this as an image in a way that Astro can understand in a way that can also import those images from the content or uh, inside of the source content directory. So let's try this one more time run this again. So the first thing that you notice or you might notice is that the URL for these images are looking kind of weird. And that's because Astro is using kind of internal URLs to define how to render these images. So if you look really closely, you can see it defines the format and width and height, etc. But we can see that these are loading WebP images and that these are much smaller than what they were originally. So our page now is going to load much faster because these images are much more optimized and they're a better format and they're much, much smaller. Now, if we click on one of these individual pages, notice that this isn't working. And that's because we're referencing this using the old image IMG tag, which can't be referenced here. So let's go into the slug page and let's just update this to use the image component from Astro Assets. And we should be able to just save this as is and have this be working. So now we're able to load this image and this should also be choosing a WebP version of this, which should be smaller than what it was originally. So now we have a working list of all the blog posts. We can then go to the individual page for a blog post. We see an optimized image and we can see all of the content associated with that blog post as well. Now with all this in place, there's one really neat thing that we can add that's really easy in Astro and pretty amazing. If we look at navigating between these pages, we see kind of this page refresh and we actually don't have the about page created but we see kind of the page refresh as we go between individual pages. And we can actually make this a little bit easier by using the view transitions API in Astro. So this will only take a second to add, but it does make a big difference in how you can view and navigate through your application. So inside of the view transitions API, you can, you can read a lot more about this. We can basically import this component and then use it inside of the head of any page that we want to have those transitions between. So since we want to, by default, use this on every single page, we can actually just import this inside of our layout file. And then somewhere in the head, we can just reference this view transitions component and save. And now we're actually going to be, a, be able to see a difference between how we navigate our pages. This is pretty neat. So let's go from this page to home. Notice we get kind of the animation. We go to blog, we get animation. We see this page, we get the animation. So it looks like a much, much better experience of navigating between pages with just one component that we can add. Now there's some additional ways that you can customize this. You can also pass state from one page to another, which is pretty neat. We won't go any deeper into this, but it is nice to know that we can add this pretty easily to make the transitions in our application look, look a lot better. Now, one additional thing I wanted to show you is that you have the ability to not only use Markdown inside of Astro for your content, you can also add MDX. And the support for this comes with a, an integration that we can add with one of those NPX Astro add commands. So let's go and add support for Markdown by pasting in this command. This will make a change to the Astro config and install that package. So we'll just go ahead and say yes to all the things that it needs to do. Yes. All right, so that should be added. And now we can do an NPM run dev to start this again. And what we should see 
If we come back to our markdown files, for example, the behind the scenes, is we can now rename this file and we could rename this to an MDX file. And now all of this should still stay the same. So if we come back to the application, so if we refresh this, we see this stays the exact same, which is exactly what we wanted. But now we can harness the power of MDX in addition to just the markdown that we were already using. Now, if we scroll back up, there's a quick section on why MDX. So now we're not gonna dive deep into this, but there are lots of really cool things that you can do like MDX only features. So you can use exported variables inside of MDX. So if you wanted to create variables at the top, you could then reference that. You can also use your front matter variables. So you could use those directly inside of here as well. And the last thing is you can reference Astro components and UI components of other frameworks like React, Vue, et cetera, inside of this as well. So if we look in the example in here, inside of the MDX part, we're importing two different components, one Astro component and one React component that we can then display right in line inside of our Markdown content. Now this is really useful for, as an example, to do like a call out inside of your blog post. If you wanna customize a call out to send somebody to a newsletter or something else, you could define those components and bring those into your, H, to your MDX files anytime that you want or need. So we're not gonna dive any deeper into MDX. That's kind of a section on its own, but it is nice to know that you have the ability to work with both Markdown and MDX files in your content with Astro. Now we can start to work on deploying this application. So we initialize this initially as a GitHub or a Git repository. So we can now do a Git status and we can see all the things that we've changed. Now, in this case, we can add everything with Git add star and then we can do a Git commit dash M to say initial commit. And all of this stuff has been committed to this local Git repository. Now, the next step is we, we need to connect this to a GitHub repository that we can then use to deploy to Netlify or Vercel. So on github.com, you can go to the top right, you can click new repository, and then we can call this FCC Astro Crash Course Test. We'll have this be a public directory. We don't wanna add a readme because we'll take care of that ourselves. We don't wanna add a git ignore. So we can create this very blank repository. And then what we'll do is just take the code into our terminal that pushes from an existing repository to our local Git repository to this GitHub repository. So you can copy this section where it adds the origin and the remote or it adds the remote origin and then pushes everything locally to that remote project inside of GitHub. All right, so it looked like it pushed all of that code up. If we come back to the GitHub repository, we can come in here and see that this has been added. And so now our next step is to go to, we'll start with Netlify. We can do Netlify and Vercel. These are both free, so you'll sign up with a free account. After you do, you can log in on Netlify. And basically what we're gonna do is add a new site where we're gonna import from an existing project. We'll choose to deploy with GitHub. And then what we'll need to do is go and choose that project that we just created. So I can search FCC dash, and this should be enough to pull up that project. All right, so we can now pull this in. We don't need to customize anything. It should pick up on what the build command is automatically. So we can go and go ahead and deploy this and this should run a build and then have this site ready for us to use after it's done. All right, so it looked like this build has finished. You can now kind of choose the random URL that they gave you. And we should see that this is deployed our application successfully so we can see our blog page. We can go and click on individual ones as well. So that is on Netlify. We could also choose to deploy this on Vercel, almost the exact same process. You'll sign up for a free account. You can then come and add a new project. You're gonna import this from a Git repository, choose from that FCC crash course project and GitHub, choose all the defaults and then go and deploy. And then after this is finished, we should have this deployed on Vercel as well. All right, so it looks like this has finished on Vercel. We can continue to the dashboard. Then we can visit this at the random URL that it's generated for us also. Now, so far, everything that we've done with Astro has been statically generated pages, but we can start to look into the SSR capabilities of Astro. So Astro actually has the ability to do a full backend if you so decide, and you have the ability to define what type of output your site is going to have. 
So by default, it is static, which takes no additional configuration for us to do, but there also is the ability to define it as a server rendered application by default. It says to use this one, most or all of your sites should be server rendered. You can also opt in to pre-rendering or static pages for individual pages. You also have the option to do hybrid, which is basically saying it's going to pre-render by default, and then you can define for individual pages to opt out of pre-rendering. Before we make this transition into server-side rendering in our code, let's actually take a couple minutes to talk about the difference between static site generation or SSG versus SSR, which is server-side rendering. And we'll talk about this while using diagrams to kind of explain the differences between the two. So let's start with what we've already been using, which is SSG or static site generation. And this is what Astro does by default. Quick reminder, if you want to follow up on this diagram later on, you can find the link in the description below. So what happens here is when we deploy our application, we deploy this to something like Netlify or Vercel, or there's lots of other hosts that you could use as well. So when this thing is deploying, it actually runs a build. And during that build process, what happens is for each one of those individual pages that we have in our Astro application, it actually generates the HTML file at build time for each one of those. So we have one for our index.html page, we have one for our blog.html page, and then additionally, we have a, an HTML page created for each one of our blog posts, and that's where we defined that export, or we exported that get static paths function, where we defined each one of the paths that we wanted to be able to support and then to generate the content for. So the important part about this is SSG at build time is going to go ahead and create the content or the HTML pages for each one of these pages at build time so that it's ready and accessible by the time someone comes and tries to view one of these blog posts, for example, or one of these other pages. And that's an important next step to talk about is the actual request time. So what happens? Well, these individual files that are generated during the build process are then saved to a CDN or a content delivery network that are replicated all across the world. What this means is that those files now are very fast to access and return when a request comes in from the browser. So let's say that you go to the browser and you type in local, not local host, but you type in the URL of the application that you're trying to work on and you go to the index page. Well, that's going to make a request to the CDN. It's going to now return that index.html page. Now let's say you then want to go to the blog page. Well, you make another request to the CDN. The CDN now is going to return blog.html. Or if you're going to one of the specific pages for an individual blog post, it's going to return those pages as well, again, because they've already been predefined. Now this starts to differ a lot when we look at SSR or server side rendering. So I've got almost an empty diagram here for SSR build time. So with server side rendering, you're still going to have a build process to go through and run all of your code. You may run tests if you have them, but basically this is going to go through and do the build of your application and you may have some static pages. We'll talk about how to mix these in a second. But for the most part, what this is going to do is now kind of have that server configured so that it can handle those requests as it comes in. So notice there's no predefined HTML pages that are already calculated for us. That means if we scroll down now that something has to happen at request time when this request comes in from the browser. So notice instead of having a CDN, we now have an application server. So requests will go from the browser to the application server. Now for this application server to respond back, most likely specifically in this case with our blog posts, individual blog post pages, it's going to need to get the information necessary for those blog posts from the database. Now in our case, we're not using a traditional database, we're using embedded markdown in our source code, but it basically works the same way. So let's say that we make a request to slash blog slash blog dash one, for example, that's the website that we're trying to go to. Well, this is going to now make a request to the database. Let's add a new piece of text in here. And it's gonna say, give me all the information that you have about blog one. So from the database, the database is going to return back the data for blog one to the application server. The application server is now going to turn that back into an HTML page, which will look like if we add our corresponding piece of text here, slash blog, slash blog dash one dot, HTML. We can move this up a little bit for readability. So basically with SSR or server side generated pages or applications, every request that comes in is going to go to an application server. And this it is then going to query the database or in whatever format it is, which might be embedded markdown that will return the data. The application server will then take that content and turn it into an HTML page that can be rendered on the browser and viewed by the user.
So that's a quick overview of the difference between SSG and SSR. Let's go back to our code and start to make this work inside of Astro. So in this case, we can start by going into the Astro config and we can choose the output property to be server. Now, if we try to run this, we should see that this is going to break. And that's because we're doing a couple of things that are specifically geared towards statically generated pages. So let's go to our running application and refresh. And we see that we now are having an issue on the individual blog post pages. And that's because the way that we're generating those pages is using this get static paths function. And that doesn't exist inside of an SSR deployed application. Now, one thing we could do is we could look in the documentation and we could see how to define this as a pre-rendered page. That means it's gonna generate this page statically. So if we add this at the top of this file and refresh, this actually will go back to working as we expect. So now we see we have that blog post, we can go back to all of them and go to another one, et cetera. But just for practice and kind of experience, let's go back and get rid of the pre-render and let's see what it would take to actually figure out how to generate these pages inside of an SSR environment. Now, in this case, what we're gonna do is go back to our page and we can actually get rid of this entire get static paths function. And we can start at the top here. And most importantly, what we're gonna do is destructure a property called slug from astro.params. Now, what Astro was going to do is because of this slug definition up here, it's gonna pass this slug into the astro.params object to let us reference it and use that in here to dynamically query that post from Astro. We can also get rid of our definition for the post and our prop types. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to get that post from an awaited call to get entry by slug. Now this is a function up here that comes from Astro content. It's a function that they give us and we can say what content collection we wanna get this from, which in this case is post and then we can pass in the slug. Now in this case, it's gonna throw an error or show us a TypeScript error because slug could be potentially undefined. So we're just gonna say this is going to be a string so that we get our appropriate type in here. Now in this case, it's throwing an error because it's saying that we might query for a post that also doesn't exist. And what we could do, we could say if that post doesn't exist, we could do an astro redirect. So we could return an astro redirect to the slash 404 page just, just to show that that thing wasn't found. Now we could go and customize this and do anything that we wanted to handle it, but in this case, this ought to be enough just to get this working and now have these dynamically generated pages be dynamically generated with server-side rendering instead of statically generated pages. So if we go back, we should see that we have all of these showing up in our blog index page, and then clicking on one should be able to show all the details for this blog post as well. So we've now completely flipped how we're rendering these blog post pages. Now they're server side rendered. And what this means, just to clarify, is as the request comes into this URL, it's gonna send a request to the server. The server is going to query based on that URL, the individual blog post, return that back, and then use that to render the page that shows up on the screen, as opposed to previously, we had each of these pages generated statically at build time for all the blog posts that we have. Now, the cool thing about this is we can still go back and configure individual pages to be configured as static. So as an example, on the home page, there's no reason that this shouldn't just be a static page. So we could still export a const pre-render variable that's set to true, and that will mark this index page as static. So if we go back here, this will be a static page versus this is server-side rendered and this individual page or all the individual pages for our blog post are server side rendered as well. Now, what I do wanna show one more thing that you can do is when you have server side rendered enabled, you can define API endpoints. So we can search for server endpoints in here. And basically what that allows us to do is have a file inside of our pages directory that just basically serves as an API endpoint instead of actually returning an Astro component. So if we go into our pages directory, we could create a new folder slash or called API, and then we could just create a test.ts. Now notice this is a TS file instead of an Astro component, again, because it only runs on the server. And if we look in here, I've just copied kind of the basic 
uh, starter code that they give us, but we're not going to reference any of this. So we can kind of get rid of all of this information about products. And then we can return back an object with a message that says, hello world. So this is how we define a starter function for API endpoints. So in this case, we're also not referencing this params parameter. So what we defined is a get endpoint where we're basically just going to return hello world as JSON. So we can save this. We can then go back to our application. We can then open the URL and go uh, back to the root and then slash API slash test. And we should get back that message with hello world. Now, what's really cool is we can define all of our HTTP endpoints with this as well. So we could also export a post function if we wanted to. We could return with the same thing. Now, unfortunately, there's not a way to be able to test this inside of the browser because the browser can only send GET requests. So I have the Postman extension inside of VS Code installed. So if you wanted to follow along, you can install the Postman extension. This has been kind of my default way of doing testing APIs for a long time, but now they have the, the VS Code extension to go with it. So we can create a new HTTP request and we can now send a POST request to the same general idea. So localhost 4321, and this will be slash API slash test. And we'll send that and we'll get the same response that we just got back with the message of hello world. Now inside of handling our post request, we could also destructure the request as well. And then we could get the body from that request by calling await request.json. And then we could just return this just to show that we're actually getting it. So let's just return that body, which is going to be an object. So we're destructuring this request. Notice we also don't have TypeScript types around this. So we could define this a little bit differently if we wanted to. I'm just gonna copy in a new kind of function definition here. So this is going to use an arrow function syntax where we define now our post to be an API route. So we can add the uh, missing import for that. And now it's gonna give us IntelliSense for the request. So if we do dot, we can see all the things that we have access to there. We also then can see uh, things that we might have on our params in here as well. So we can now save this. And what we should see is if we go back to our request, this is a post request, but it doesn't have a body. So we can now uh, inject in here a raw body with JSON and we can have an object and we can have a property of uh, name and we could say Astro crash course. And then what this should return back with is that same object that we can see down here. So we have the ability in Astro to define any and all kind of server capabilities that we wanted. We could handle form submissions. We could define API endpoints for all of our different methods, which is really, really cool and really, really powerful. So I think the only next step is to show how do we actually deploy this to Netlify and Vercel now that we're doing server-side rendering. So inside of here, we have a, a plugin or an integration for both Netlify and Vercel. So I'm gonna copy and paste this command. So here's the Netlify one. And let's paste this in here for Netlify. And this is going to add that package. And then it's gonna make an addition to our astro.config file to use Netlify as the host. So notice it says adapter is Netlify, we'll say yes. And then if we look inside of the astro config, we should see that it's referencing adapter Netlify here. So now what we'll wanna do is we, we will uh, add everything. We'll do a git commit with a message of uh, added SSR and deploy to Netlify. And then since this is already connected to our Netlify site, we can push this and Netlify ought to automatically pick this up, pick up that change. Let's just log back in. It should pick up that change automatically and it should be building a new version of that that now is going to be our server side rendered version. So we'll let this go through our build and then we'll open this up to make sure everything looks okay. Now, as this is building, one thing to notice, it's referencing Netlify functions. I actually just missed it, but inside of building, you can see that it references deploying this to Netlify functions. So that's how it's actually able to deploy this. It looks like everything is complete. We should be able to open this production deploy. Hopefully everything now continues to look okay, just like it did before. And we can see the individual blog post pages as well. Now, next we'll need to do this for uh, Vercel. So we can copy in that same command and then uh, add in Vercel. Now this is gonna go through that same process, add the Vercel package, and then it's gonna update the Astro config to reference that Vercel 
uh, adapter. So we can say yes to that as well. So now this is updated. We can uh, add everything again. We can commit and say uh, hosting on Vercel. Then we can push this. Now do note that this uh, deploy in Netlify, we're still connected to Netlify, so this will kick off another build. That next build will fail in Netlify, uh, but what we do wanna see is inside of Vercel, we should see that this is kicking off a new build in Vercel. So we can see under the building tab that it's going through and it's doing this. So when that finishes, we should see that we have the same deployed application hosted now on Vercel using SSR. All right, so it looks like it's finished. We should now be able to visit this and we have the same experience where we can go to blog, we can see all the pages, we can go to the individual page, et cetera. Now going back to the idea of SSR inside of Astro, one of the coolest things that you could do in addition to API endpoints and other things is you could start to incorporate authentication into your applications. So you have the ability with Astro to create full fledged, full stack applications and you can do authentication in here by referencing cookies as an example. So you could track a session in a cookie for a user and you could gate pages to prevent users from getting to certain pages if they're not logged in or if they don't have certain permissions or anything like that with authentication. In that full Astro course, we actually build a basic authentication strategy using SSR in Astro as well as taking advantages of taking advantage of cookies and then having that reference users that are saved inside of a Zeta database. So another really cool full stack implication or example of what you can build with Astro. Now, if you want a full overview of what we build in that course, you can go to astrocourse.dev and it breaks down everything that we're gonna build inside of this full application, including all the topics that are covered, the pricing, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, you can find that at astrocourse.dev. All in all, I hope you're as excited about Astro as a framework as I am. Obviously, I'm pretty excited. So thanks for checking out this crash course, and I really hope that you enjoyed it.